Progenobiome is actually a research laboratory. We're trying to figure out the microbiome and multiple clinical trials. I'm going to start my first slide with all disease begins in the gut. And 2,500 years later, we're showing that. William Osler, 1849 to 1919, said, one of the first duties of the physician is to educate the masses not to take medicines. William Mayo, 1861 to 1931, said, the aim of medicine is to prevent disease, prolong life. The ideal medicine is to eliminate the need for a physician. So where have we gone wrong? Four billion prescriptions in 2011. Welcome to Drug America. And so one wonders, when you look at the map, it's not only drugs from, you know, pharmaceutical, but it's everything from herbs to natural products to everything that we're putting into our gut microbiome. And when you look at the map of America, you start noticing that obesity is creeping up in America. In the Hispanic population, it's greater half the country is between 30 and 35% obese. In the African-American, it's actually greater than 35%, the half of the country. So obesity seems to be a big problem in America. And you, know, you wonder why, why did that happen? What are we doing to our guts that is causing this? But it's not only in America, you're starting to see obesity in North America, you're starting to see it in Africa, in Australia. So what is going on? to the microbiome potentially that could be increasing um, obesity. Well, you know, we know one thing, globalization. We definitely share our products. We, you know, have to have tomatoes in the middle of December. So we get those tomatoes from somewhere. Are we bringing on microbes that are basically adding to this problem? And with globalization, we've noticed there's a problem called globesity. Now, when you look at COVID and why did I feel that, you know, I needed to step into to the world of research and look at COVID, because what I noticed from the beginning is COVID is all around the world, much like obesity is starting to creep up. And when you look at patients with COVID that are susceptible and those who actually die from COVID, the one thing we notice is there's an obesity problem, but it's not only obesity, it's autism. Look around the world at the problem of autism. And I'm gonna focus on that because that was something that I was not really you know, in tune with um, early on as a physician because I wasn't seeing these patients. I'm a gastroenterologist. But then I started seeing them, especially with the interest of fecal transplant. And I realized that in 1980, the rate of autism was one in 2000. And now it's one in 40. So what is going on that we are increasing the rate of autism, that we are increasing obesity? Is it the foods? Is it the super size? Is it the hamburger that you ate with antibiotics? Is it the meds, the herbs over the counter that are not really supervised by anybody or the medications, frankly? And, you know, with COVID, and we've certainly seen that, there is definitely a marketing movement that is going on that is confusing everyone. And that is certainly making you, you know, ask the question, well, could this medication help my kid? You know, I Googled autism probiotic and I found a 90 day money back guarantee for autism probiotic. Well, you know, why do we have one in 40 kids with autism if we have a 90 day money back guarantee, right? The other thing that I started Googling, you know, I, we've all gained weight on the, on the quarantine, staying home, not exercising, not going to the gym. And I Googled that you could actually do this LA Extreme Pack that looks like an Academy Award almost that gets you enticed to buy this product. What is that product doing to my microbiome? I can tell you one thing, it's not gonna give me back my abs. The other thing you can notice is look at the marketing. Skinny greens, green collar entices you to wanna eat a salad. So am I gonna buy this product that makes me look like I'm gonna eat a salad instead of eating the salad to be skinny? So these products are a little bit deceptive in my opinion. So what is the truth? Well, we certainly hear everything. You've heard the poop pill this morning, probiotics, the wine, you know, uh, Neil, Dr. Stolman said, one glass of wine actually improves your microbiome. One cup of coffee improves your microbiome. What is the truth? And anytime somebody tries to sell me something, um, you know, especially around Malibu, I basically say, show me the data. Where's the data? So 
I wrote the book with Dr. Barodi because I felt that the public needed to know the truth. So let's talk shit. So the microbiome and has been sugar-coated, but the reality is we need to understand what we're talking about when we talk about the microbiome. So we know the microbiome is a collection of all genomes of microbes in an ecosystem. But I'm gonna explain it in, in mechanical terms and show this video, which I think explains it well. This is a transmission of a car. Now, most people look at your car and you open the transmission and you think, wow, it's just this big solid piece of material. But when you break down the transmission, you actually start noticing that there's 880 pieces in the transmission, much like the microbiome, that big log in your toilet you think is just nothing, is actually trillions and trillions of microbes. Now, the interesting thing about the transmission is if you break one little piece, then another piece gets broken and another piece gets broken. So you can fix the transmission, but you will never fix it back properly until you change that transmission. I know you're gonna use a transmission of a Honda into a Mercedes or vice versa, no. So you have to start thinking of fecal transplant much like the transmission of a car, and that's how I look at it. And so 25 years ago or more than that, when I was in medical school, we used to think one infection was caused by one bacteria. But really what we discovered from you know, fecal transplant and C. diff, and as you've heard, and this is a beautiful slide from Dr. Colleen Kelly, by the way, that I stole and just changed a couple of lines. No microbe is alone. Killing one affects others, and killing one creates a dysbiosis and imbalance. And frankly, C. diff, that I've been trying to kill for 25 years doing clinical trials, is the basic model of dysbiosis in human disease and actually imbalance. So fecal transplant in C. diff opened our eyes to the power of the microbiome. And I think that's the whole movement and this whole movement that started and actually got me to, and Dr. Kelly and Dr. Stolman to think about the Malibu microbiome meeting. Because these are the question that happens. What happens when the colon was like this before transplant, after transplant looks like this? Crohn's disease, before, after. And the, the key article from Dr. Kelly uh, were these two cases of alopecia areata that basically after fecal transplant for C. diff grew hair. So what grows hair in the microbiome and therefore the beginning of progenobiome? Because when I sent my stools to different labs, I wasn't getting the answers I wanted. So I had to step in the mud and create a lab to understand the microbiome but more also as a healthcare revolution to get doctors to start thinking about the microbiome and human beings to start thinking and understanding. What was the first thing we discovered in our lab? Well, that we're all different. It wasn't surprising uh, to me that we're all different. We all have different fingerprints. Certainly our microbiome must be different. So to find this in 26 patients uh, was not surprising to me. Every column is a patient, and it's almost you have to look at it as a signature microbiome. Um, and every color is a group of microbes. So if we're different, how can we be compared? If we're different, how can we have a reference of what's normal? And I think Dr. Stolman mentioned it this morning when he said he would get these labs and people would come to his office and say, well, what does that mean that I have a lot of bacteroides? Well, you know, we don't know yet because we don't have those references. Why do I say that? Because there's been a lot of research on this. However, the research on the microbiome, and I come from a, a expertise as a clinical trial doctor, so that knows how to put these clinical trials through and, and products through market. The problem with the microbiome and the microbiome analysis is that it doesn't account a lot of different factors. The age, can we compare a 20 year old to a 100 year old? Absolutely not. Can we compare an Italian person who eats pasta to a Mexican who eats nachos? Can we compare a BMI of a skinny person to an overweight person? Can we compare a vegetarian vegan diet to a carnivore or gluten-free? Can we compare someone who drinks one glass of alcohol to someone who drinks five glasses per day or a bottle? Can we compare someone that 
takes marijuana, takes drugs, cocaine, methadone, to someone who doesn't. And finally, past medical history and surgical history plays a huge role in assessing the microbiome. So all of these factors need to be really well analyzed when you look at the microbiome. So I have become a forensic scientist of the microbiome. And, you know, as doctors, and I think Dr. Uh, Paul this morning said, you know, we are detectives, we are diagnosticians. People come to us, the buck stops with us. And, you know, there's a famous line from a movie that said, ABC, always be closing. And we are the closure. We are the, the people that tell these patients after they've seen three and four and five doctors um, what we believe. So we have to be extremely um, scientists and use forensic medicine and use everything in our ability to understand the microbiome. So this is me at like one or two o'clock in the morning. You could tell that once I stepped into this field, I'm obsessed. And uh, my husband will say, all I talk about is the microbiome. My kids will say it. It's always about the microbiome for me. So, but the microbiome is fascinating because it isn't a view into what we don't understand. An invisible world of microbes that are all interacting together to understand life, to understand disease. And um, Dr. Uh, Papuzzi mentioned, you know, how we do next generation sequencing and how we look at the microbiome. I like to bring it back to, because uh, I'm very big on figurative, and I like to bring it back to scuba diving. So if you're scuba diving and you're looking at the surface, so we have a choice when we do sequencing, we can look at the surface. And of course, when you see the surface, and a lot of labs, you know, probably do that. They see the surface of the ocean. You see beautiful fish, beautiful life just floating. But the real life and the real, you know, creatures lie at the bottom of the ocean, the invisible world that we do not see that's deep, deep in the depth of the ocean. And that's what we do when we look at the microbiome. So again, every column is an individual. We can look at it superficially, and you can see superficially, you see a lot of blue, and everybody has a lot of pale blue and dark blue together. But then when you go deeper, you see that everybody is different, and everybody has different relation, different microbes. And does that mean that they're unhealthy or healthy? Uh, that could be healthy for them. So when you find a species, I really believe you find answers. So what was the first thing we found answers for? Well, I used to go into the hospital. C. diff was my bug for 20, 25 years, thanks to Dr. Stolman, who brought me into this world of C. diff. And I went the route of doing clinical trials for C. diff to try to kill it. When C. diff clinical trials didn't work, I would do fecal transplant. And 92 to 99% success, I would be done with the patient and no more antibiotics. So C. diff has been my bug. Lo and behold, when I did next generation sequencing and I started seeing my samples actually, I noticed, wow, C. diff is present in me, but it's also present in 100 patients. The fingerprint of C. diff, not the bug that causes the bad toxin, but the bug that is just living in our environment, in our guts. C. diff is actually 10 million years old and it's in our gut. It's living there peacefully until and this is what we learned from fecal transplant, is you start seeing that if you give it antibiotics, you start killing the microbiome around that C. diff. And then what you can see in this picture, so the black line on both sides, so the Shannon index is really the diversity and the Simpson index shows diversity. When you kill off the diversity in your, mic in your microbiome, in other words, you're taking a couple of antibiotics for ear infection or you were the dentist, what happens is you kill off that diversity. When you kill off that diversity and you're trying to implant, what are we doing when we're doing fecal transplant? We're re-implanting a new microbiome. We're essentially re-giving you the diversity. And what you start seeing is in the pre and post, the patients start matching the donor. In other words, that diversity that they were lacking, that, that they got rid of, is what improved uh, their condition and they no longer had C. diff. So the question becomes, is C. diff a bad guy or a good guy? Is C. diff just a good guy living in us? And then once we start killing off all the families around it, 
it becomes a bad guy to potentially uh, kill the host. And that's my thought anyways. Um, and my hypothesis, and that's what I'm trying to prove, because I've been treating patients with C. diff all along, and I never caught it. But then when you go to the hospitals, they tell you to gown up and that you're going to be the transmitting person. And I couldn't understand how would I be able to transmit C. diff if I've never got it or any of my staffs have ever got it. So another thing that we noticed when we look into the microbiome, and, and of course with COVID-19, um, it made sense that if, ACE, if COVID sits in the ACE2 receptors, it would be found in the colon um, and in the stool sample because actually the biggest organ of ACE2 receptor is the colon. So I always say to people, the microbiome will tell the story because again, it's forensics, it's, uh, it's it's, it's fine-tuning, it's understanding, going deep into the research and trying to find the answer. The microbiome will tell the story of COVID, and this is a perfect example. I did a podcast, you're welcome to look at it on YouTube, with a farmer from Kansas. And this farmer will tell the story how he, his wife had COVID, he kissed her, he took her saliva, put it in his eyes, he had her cough on him. He slept with the woman, ate the same food, and he never got COVID. So as a scientist obsessed with the microbiome, you bet that I asked him for his stool. So we will get that answer. But it brings up the, the idea of why am I looking at the microbiome of husband and wife? So when you look at the microbiome, and I said before, you cannot compare two people. However, in a family, this is my family portrait. So the first column is my husband, the second column is me, and then the third column is child one and child two. You can see how mm, the two columns in the middle are very similar, and me and my daughter are very similar, and yet my husband and my little one are very similar at a microbiome level. So a lot of people will say, well, why do you need to look at the families? Because really, you cannot compare an apple and an orange from different families. But within the family itself, people that are living together, you can compare and you can have an idea. So this is fat autism. And so when you look at autism, the first parent is the mother. The second, the first, second column is child one. Third column is child two. Again, remember, every color is different microbes or families of microbes. And then the third one, it, the fourth column is the kid with autism. So one wonders when you, and these are triplets, by the way, in the same mom. So one wonders if during pregnancy, the mother passed most of the bad microbes to the third kid, or did something happen? But why did the mother start off with these microbes that were abnormal or out of um, balance? Same thing, another family with autism, um, mother, and then first child, second child, you could see that, and you don't have to be a microbiologist to see that the kid with autism is the one in the middle. Some parent, mother and child, you could see diversity is equal, and you don't really see something going on in the microbiome. This is a perfect example of a family that we did where the mother is the first column, second column is a, is a father, third column is child one, fourth column is child two, and you can't really tell who is the autistic child in there. And this is why forensic medicine applying, you know, the, the formula of looking at each microbes, looking at everything, you know, made us look at this and say, well, wow, well, the fourth kid has a lot of eramosum. If you know the literature on eramosum, it has been linked to some inflammation of the gut. So one wonders, well, maybe this is the bacteria that is a problem in this kid with autism. And notice how I say this kid because everybody is different. And when we look further in this kid, we also notice that there was a higher level of the sofa vibrio. For those of you who know the work of Dr. Sidney Feingold, who put me on this path and told me once I would understand the microbiome, once I buy a generation machine and open a genetic lab, I'll understand autism and Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Dr. Feingold thought that the sulfa vibrio was a possible bacteria for autism. Well, in this family, it certainly is a possibility. The other thing we discovered, and you know, remember I said at the beginning, um, you got to be careful of what you're taking into your body. We took 30 patients 
and some of them were not taking any probiotics, healthy individuals. We correlated them with age, race, matched them, and we decided, well, we're going to compare them. And what we noticed is in the people that took these poor, unregulated probiotics, they had no bifidobacteria in their gut whatsoever, making you wonder if perhaps what they're taking in from that's not regulated, perhaps dead bacteria in the, in the probiotic is actually killing their microbiome. And then when you look at people with high quality probiotics, in other words, the people that eat the yogurts and the frozen probiotics were actually pretty much similar to people who were not taking probiotic. So the microbiome tells a story. This is a story and I'm gonna wrap up quickly because I know I'm running behind. Um, and uh, Howard was nice enough not to give me the two minutes. Um, this is a mother first column. The second column is a um, microbiome that was enhanced in a child with Crohn's disease. And what we did is we manipulated the microbiome to try to find out if we can help this kid. And actually the, the assay and the lab data that we got from this showed us that after manipulating the microbiome, we were able to not only reach success in the clinical picture of this kid where he started getting better, but actually his Shannon index of diversity was improved and he started matching the mom a little bit better. Dr. Barodi posted, and he'll be talking this afternoon on Crohn's disease. Um, I took the stools of a patient of Crohn's that was cured, and we don't like to use the word cured in medicine, but when a patient doesn't need any uh, biologics or anything, we basically you know, call that cure, in my opinion. When they stop seeing the doctor, that's a cure. But we don't like to say cure, so I'm going to say improved. So Dr. Barodi had a paper that he, that he printed, and I asked him to see the microbiome. And what I discovered on the microbiome, first column is the mom, second column is the, is the dad. The third is the child with Crohn's disease, who, as you could see, has no diversity whatsoever. The patient was treated with anti-MAP therapy. And as you can see at the end, he's completely improved. He's been two years off medications, no symptoms of Crohn's disease, and his microbiome picture is actually starting to improve and engraftment is occurring. So diversity is key. Diversity is key when we saw it in C. diff. This is the first column is a patient before fecal transplant, and he had a Shannon index score of 3.8. We gave him a donor that was 6.2, and lo and behold, he started matching the donor to the point that, and this was a donor uh, a sample that I got from Dr. Alex Kurutz Bank at University of Minnesota. So very appreciative for that donor because the patient is still two years out, cured with C. diff, and um, has improved his psoriasis actually, which was an interesting finding, and his urinary tract infection. So the donor in this case really helped him. Um, when we looked at obesity, Again, um, this is the first one was a morbidly obese patient at 660 pounds that I looked at the microbiome. And remember at the beginning, obesity is a problem. Is obesity a loss of diversity because of what we're putting in our gut? We compared them, we compared the patient to people that were hypermetabolizers, I call them. And you could see that there was a lot more diversity in the hypermetabolizer. Crohn's disease seems to also be a potential problem of diversity and low relative abundance, but we're looking at that. Autism in some patients, there is a low diversity. So the way I'd like to correlate it, and I'll wrap this up, loss of diversity to me equates disease and diversity equates health. And I'm gonna bring it up to humanity when you have beautiful, diverse hum humans from all over the world, India, uh, Australia, Canada, all different, all beautiful. That is the beauty of humanity. You change that microbiome, you change the, the diversity, you try to create people that are using one pill solution, one form for everybody. This is the danger. And I'm gonna bring it back to nature uh, because I like to have people you know, see the, on the bigger picture. We are all understanding that the Amazon jungle is the heart of the planet Earth. And we all see when the Amazon jungle is burning, our hearts 
are breaking because we realize that the microbes of the Amazon jungle have been untouched. It is the beginning of planet Earth. It is the beginning of nature, microbes, etc. When you start removing the microbes, when you start removing trees, you start losing life and you essentially end up with a desolate planet. I, I think we need the importance of this meeting for me, and if there's one message that I need to push out there, it's really the importance of preserving the microbiome and preserving the microbiome of humanity, because without preserving the individual microbiome, we may lose humanity. And so I started with Hippocrates, and this was a very, very, uh, you know, astute uh, physician who said all disease begins in the gut, and he was right. And then his, my last slide will be first do no harm. So it's very important that when we step into this world of microbes and, and doing fecal transplant, that we understand that the first thing we have to do is make sure we're not killing the patients in our hopes to cure the patients.